All right, it's hit two minutes past, so I think we should get started. Um, so hello everyone and welcome to today's Open Access Week session, today focused on linked open data. Um, housekeeping out the way uh, at the front, these talks are going to be recorded and made openly available online, so please turn off your microphone and camera. Um, and add any questions that you have into the chat window as we go through and we'll ask the speaker at the end of the session for some good discussion. Um, we'll aim to finish up just before the hour so that the, uh, those going to the follow-up workshop can grab a cup of tea before we head over. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on today, in my case the lands of the Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and I'd encourage you to all think about whose lands you're currently situated on. Of course, we're all coming from across the world currently. Um, and I'd like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Um, so today we have a speaker from New Zealand, Siobhan Leachman. Um, and we often focus in Open Access Week on the point of view of the, the researcher or funder or librarian. And I think Siobhan is a really great advocate for open access coming from the angle of real world use cases. So very much from the, the user point of view and how to take this sort of open access data and open access content and combine it to create something greater than the sum of its parts. Um, so with that, I would like to hand over to Siobhan um, and looking forward to the talk. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully this works. Can, hopefully everyone can see that. So kia ora koutou katoa. Um, I'm Siobhan Leachman. I'm a Wikimedian and citizen scientist. And I'm here to talk to you about how um, open access benefits the work I do with biodiversity information and data. Now, many folk believe open access means access to scientific literature, and it does, but I want to discuss how open access is so much more generous than that. Ah, sorry, let me try and, oh, for goodness sake. Let me try and move that along. There we go. Sorry about that, I will get better as we go along. So this is how open access is defined in Wikipedia. And I take a really wide view of what constitutes a research output. I want access not just to scholarly articles, I want access to data that's helped generate those articles, the citation data of those articles, as well as the journals they're published in. I want access to the images and illustrations and their metadata that might be found in those articles. I want access to the data about the authors, collectors, expeditions, institutions that help facilitate the production of those articles. To me, these are the types of research outputs I'm interested in. And my definition of what constitutes access is just as wide. Access to me is synonymous with reuse. I don't just want the ability to look at or um, read the research content. Open access is having the ability to reuse that research output. And in this presentation, I wanna illustrate how important this generous view of open access is to what I do. And I'm gonna take you through three workflows. I'm aiming to show you how I can only do what I do if institutions and individuals provide open access to biodiversity knowledge. I want to try and convince you to think about open access as I think about it, with a wide definition of research output, and with access meaning the ability to reuse those research outputs. Now, my playground is the biodiversity knowledge graph, the interconnected network of taxa, taxonomic names, publications, people, species, sequences, images, and collections. I work to enrich this network by adding to it and by making those connections. And the tools that I use to play in this particular sandpit are Wikipedia, Wikicommons, and Wikidata. I use these three wiki projects to curate and to link information and data on biodiversity with and to each other, hopefully helping to enrich the knowledge graph and in turn making it easier for others to build upon. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia edited 
it's editable by anyone, but perhaps you may not be aware of the other two pro wiki projects I've mentioned. There's Wiki Commons, which is an online repository of free to use images, sounds and other media. It's, um, it's full of pub public domain and openly licensed images that can be reused for free by anyone. And I upload images to Wiki Commons to be used in Wikipedia, in Wikidata, and also in other websites. Wikidata is a multilingual linked open database. It's a structured database that can be edited, queried, and reused by anyone. It's CC0 licensed. And importantly, Wikidata isn't just an open database. It's also an identifier hub. That is, it links out to other databases. So I add data and identifiers to Wikidata, and these data and identifiers can then be queried and reused by anyone for any purpose. So how do I use these three Wiki projects in conjunction with other open access content for my work? Well, my first example that I'm going to give you is my ongoing New Zealand endemic moss project. Now I got inspired to work on New Zealand endemic moss because of Manaki Whenua Land Care Research, a New Zealand Crown Research Institute. And that started a citizen science project, getting schools to participate in studying and generating data on New Zealand moss. And it seemed obvious to me that Wikipedia would be one of those first places that those children would go to, to look for information on the species they were studying. But many of the approximately 1,650 endemic moths of New Zealand lacked a Wikipedia page. So I started creating and expanding articles. And the first place I look to when researching these types of articles is the publication that contains the original um, scientific description of the species. Because it's much easier to study a species if you know the name of it and you can distinguish it. And the original scientific description is the very start of this process. So I wanted to make sure that original description was in Wikipedia. And the place I go to to first try and find this original scientific description is the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Now BHL is a consortium of natural history and botanical libraries all cooperating to digitise and make accessible and reusable legacy literature of biodiversity. And because BHL contains open access content, I can not only cite those scientific articles, I can copy the original description of moss into Wikipedia, making them easier for citizen scientists to find. Now when writing, sorry, I'll just skip, oh, so sorry, there we go. Um, when writing a Wikipedia article, I'm also attempting to find images of species. Obviously, if you've got citizen scientists looking for endemic moths, it really helps if they've got some sort of idea about what the moths look like. For New Zealand endemic moths, I've got several open access data sets of images to choose from. Both Manaki Senua Land Care Research and Auckland Museum license their images under a CC BY license, an open license, but not, that only requires attribution when you reuse those images. So I'm free to download those images, upload them into Wiki Commons, and reuse them, both in the Wikipedia article and also the related Wikidata item for that species. And I think this is a really good example of how institutions open access policy for their research content can actually attract people to actively engage with and reuse their content. But with New Zealand having so many species of endemic moth, many do not have an openly licensed photo available. And if I can't find a reusable photo, I go back to the scientific literature to see if there might be an illustration. And if the literature is truly open access, I can download that illustration and add it to Wiki Commons for reuse. But often, for a lot of New Zealand endemic species, it's normal to find that there are no openly licensed photos or illustrations available. And this can really hold back citizen scientists gathering biodiversity data. Because how can data be collated if folks don't even know what they're looking for? I've gotten so frustrated at this lack that I started directly contacting institutions with collections, campaigning and persuading them to re release their specimen images more openly. 
and one of my success stories is New Zealand's National Museum, Te Papa Tongarewa. They are currently in the process of clearing their specimen images for reuse under a CC BY copyright license. This will give me one more open access institution to check to see if they have appropriate specimen images. And these are the two. Obviously, there's Lankia research images and Auckland Museum images in the article. Oh, sorry, I'll go back. Um, while still writing my Wikipedia article, I'll also double check that the taxon bar is included in the article. So if you look at the slide at the bottom, you'll see um, a little bar that says taxon identifiers. This taxon bar is where identifiers sourced from external databases are displayed in the Wikipedia article. The taxon bar automatically pulls these external database identifiers from the Wikidata species item. Now, obviously, it relies on those identifiers from those databases being added to Wikidata. And of course, this adding of data to Wikidata is made so much easier if the sourcing institution's data set is open access, openly licensed for reuse. It can then be easily ingested into Wikidata and used to populate appropriate Wikipedia articles. Now, it is possible that an institution may have a whole data set that isn't generously or openly licensed. In fact, some institutions have whole databases like that. But individual facts and identifiers are not themselves copyrightable. So while Wikidata editors may not be entitled to copy the entire data set in bulk, editors are able to add identifiers individually. And for my purposes, the two particular databases I want to ensure are linked to a species Wikidata item are the iNaturalist and also the Global Biodiversity Information Facility or GBIF identifiers. Now, iNaturalist is a citizen science website and app that enables anyone to collect species observations. It also happens to be one of the best places to get images of New Zealand endemic species, but it has an issue. Its default license is a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Use license. So the data and images contained in iNaturalist aren't automatically open access, unless the an uh, iNaturalist user deliberately changes their default license, I'm unable to reuse those species images in Wikicommons. Now, I've been working with other Wikipedia editors to raise this issue with iNaturalist to attempt to persuade them to change their default license. And this is still a work in progress. But in the meantime, I've been reaching out to individual iNaturalist users, requesting they change their default license and move to a more open license, allowing the open reuse of their images because this can pay real dividends, even if I convince only a few, because sometimes the images are the only images on these species available. And as I said, the other identifier I'm really keen to link to the Wikidata item and re in return to the species Wikipedia article is the GBIF identifier. Now the Global Biodiversity Information Facility is an international network and research infrastructure funded by the world's government and aiming to provide anyone anywhere with open access to data about the life on Earth. It's doing its best to provide open access data. And I say doing its best because some institutions supply data sets using closed reuse licenses. The reason I want to link these two identifiers into the Wikidata species item is to ensure that these data are interconnected. Because I'm a firm believer in that the more connected data on a species is, the easier it is for people to find reuse and query that data, and in turn, the easier it is to build upon it. Once both iNaturalist and GBIF identifiers are added to the species wiki data item, those identifiers will be used to pull, be pulled into the taxon bar in the Wikipedia article, and readers of that article could then just click on that identifier link to be taken directly to either of those two databases to find out more on the species. Now, while in Wikidata, I'll also ensure other information and data is added to the species item. Information like the endemic nature of the species, the author and year of the original scientific publication. If I'm lucky, I can link the article that contains the original um, description. And this enables anyone who's interested, and this includes museum curators and taxonomists, to easily find these scientific publications with just the click of a mouse. 
and I'll cite the scholarly articles and published data sets to support the factual statements I'm making in Wikidata. So to summarise, I've created an article that includes a reference to the original description. I've also added the actual description to the Wikipedia article. I've added at least one image to Wikicommons and reused that image in Wikipedia article and the species um, Wikidata item. I've created and expanded the species Wikidata item. I've added as many data identifiers from different databases as I can find, along with other information, such as the author and year of description, endemic nature, even hosts of species. And I've added references supporting these statements. And all this work is to help citizen scientists and others easily get to the information they need to learn about and identify moth species they're trapping and gathering data on. So that the more information on, that, on, the, on these species can actually be generated. And all this relies on open access to information, data and images. Hopefully you're beginning to realise exactly how much work can be done linking information in the biodiversity knowledge graph if the content and databases created and provided by institutions and individuals are open access. But I'm not finished yet. I then return to the iNaturalist website. Now because Wikipedia itself is open access, that is licensed for reuse under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license, iNaturalist can automatically ingest the Wikipedia article I've written into its site. And iNaturalist also allows its members to upload the species images previously added to Wikicommons into iNaturalist. So the open access images I've sourced from institutions such as Manaki Whenua Landcare Research, Auckland Museum, or Te Papa can be added to iNaturalist species pages. And this is important because these images of species have been accurately identified by knowledgeable experts and can therefore be used by the citizen scientists to compare against their own observations. If I've done my job, a citizen scientist using iNaturalist will both have an expertly identified images and a well-written Wikipedia article to help them identify their own observations of particular species. And so open access content will also help ensure the accuracy of citizen science generated biodiversity data. Now these citizen scientists, when they upload their own species observations into iNaturalist, can get them um, confirmed to research grade by other users. And then once it's at research grade, that observation data is ingested back into GBIS. Remember GBIS, the external identifier listed in Wikidata and in turn included in the taxon bar in the Wikipedia article? So any confirmed observation data on species in iNaturalist adds to the quality of the data linked to in Wikidata and Wikipedia. And if I've convinced the iNaturalist user to change their default license and to allow open access to their image, the image of their observation is also available for upload into Wikicommons. And in this way, there's this virtuous cycle of reuse which has been created, each edition building on the last, and none of this would have been possible for me to do without open access principles being put into practice by a wide variety of institutions and individuals. Now I'm going to move on to my second example of how open access empowers my work. And this is a more digital humanities example, but with a biodiversity knowledge twist. Because as well as being interested in New Zealand endemic moths, I'm also really interested in women scientific illustrators. And my aim with this example is to show you how it's possible to reuse open access data and images to help encourage further research into women scientific illustrators. It helps give attribution and credit to these underrepresented and often underacknowledged con contributors to scientific knowledge. Now I got interested in women scientific illustrators because of open access content. I was volunteering for the Biodiversity Heritage Library the open access digital repository for biodiversity literature. Now BHL has an extensive collection of scientific illustrations in Flickr sourced from their literature and I would volunteer by tagging those images both with taxonomic names as well as illustrator tags and this tagging made those images easier to find in Flickr for reuse. But most importantly to me this tagging and the tags I created was also incorporated into Wikicommons 
when those Flickr images were bulk uploaded into Wiki Commons by other editors. I was collaborating with another volunteer, Michelle Marshall, in this tagging work. And while doing this work, both Michelle and I were enthusiastically encouraged by Grace Costantino, the BHL Outreach and um, Communications Manager. And while tagging, we would come across women artists. I mean, so many women artists, amazing women, about whom there appeared little known or written. Some of these women would be illustrating multiple articles, books and scientific publications. Others were actually writing books and articles or amassing collections of specimens or having species named after them as well as publishing scientific illustrations. And both Michelle and I were keen to find out more about these women, but there was often very little written about them on the internet. Every once in a while, there might be a woman who had significant coverage, perhaps enough so a Wikipedia article had been created for her. But this was very much definitely the exception to the rule. And this lack of coverage was really frustrating for both of us. So Michelle and I started researching. Me with the aim of writing the Wikipedia article, her with the aim of writing blog posts and also enriching her own scientific art social media account. Now the women who created these scientific illustrations didn't tend to exhibit in art galleries and their art was created to enhance scientific publications and wasn't treated as standalone works worthy of critique or even public display. It was often a real challenge, therefore, to find information on these women. I mean, historically, much of these women's illustration work wasn't regarded at the time of their creation as being worthy of comment. At most, they might receive a passing remark in the reviews of the publication, or perhaps an acknowledgement by the author of the work. And this lack of um, acknowledgement resulted in them being overlooked by library catalogers. Often they and their contributions were simply not recorded in databases. But working together, Michelle and I undertook to help rectify this. Often we could track down enough information to work out who these women were, what scientific works they'd contributed to, and whom they worked for. I mean, one of the most useful resources for this was of course what I regard as the open access diamond that is BHL. While we were doing this work, BHL enabled a full text search of their content. And this um, advance in technology significantly improved our ability to find these women in the scientific literature within BHL. Sometimes having open access to literature is really of little use if technology doesn't, find, um, doesn't support the finding of content inside it and the ability to full text search BHL content revolutionized our research work. Once I'd researched or we'd researched these women, I'd then add the women, any data we'd found, found about them and any identifiers we'd also discovered to Wikidata. Now Wikidata is a resource, just like Wikipedia, that informs Google's knowledge graph. So if I can get these women into Wikidata, I can go some way to ensuring that they and their data is findable by other researchers via a Google search. And I'd also use the reference section in the Wikidata statements, not just to provide evidence and support of the statements I was making, but also with an eye to helping collate all the links we'd discovered during our research. I wanted to leave a research breadcrumb trail, making it easier for me and others like me to refine these sources and then reuse them, for example, in Wikipedia articles on these women. Now, obviously, if external identifiers that exist, I also wanted to include them. But to my disappointment, despite the prestige of the work these, that these women were illustrating, many of the women were not listed in external um, databases. I'd always check BIAS, the Virtual International Authority File Database, which gives information sourced from national, national libraries. And although BIAS would frequently list the author of the scientific publication, information on the illustrator of these works was often missing. Library, libraries seemed to prioritise those who wrote the words rather than those who created the art that illustrated the work, even if the illustrations made up a large proportion of the publication. I'd also check the Stuttgart Scientific Illustrators database. Now this is one of the most comprehensive databases for scientific artists. Sometimes the women would be in the database, but sometimes not. Sometimes only under their maiden name, 
or only under their married name, not both. Or if both, they were listed as two separate people. Although a fabulous starting point, this database also wasn't as comprehensive as I needed. But the wonderful thing about this particular database was how responsive its creator, the history department of the University of Stuttgart is, to email. Both Michelle and I would write to them, including our research on particular women illustrators and asking for these women to be included. And the University of Stuttgart History Department would add these women to their database and generate an external identifier. And they would also be able to link in resources that neither Michelle nor I had access to. More often, oh, sorry, often more data was added on these women in the uh, Stuttgart database as a result of their further research. Now, the Stuttgart Scientific Illustrator database as a whole is not open access in that the whole database is copyrighted. But as explained previously, individual facts and identifiers aren't copyrightable. So I can add their specific identifier to an artist's wiki data item. I can also add statements about the facts contained in the database, using the database as a reference to support the statements I'm making in Wikidata. And Michelle and I would also contact BHL about these women. We would request that the BHL record would be amended to include them. And if necessary, and if the, sorry, and if the necessary criteria was satisfied, BHL would then edit the metadata, metadata and in doing so create another external identifier, the BHL creator ID. And this identifier would help collate and connect the works the women had illustrated to the women themselves. And that identifier can then be added to Wikidata. Obtaining a creator ID can ensure a cascade of linked open data, and it raised, can raise the visibility of these underappreciated women to researchers, making it easier for researchers to find the works the women contributed to. Slowly, I felt we were beginning to make a real difference in surfacing these women. At least now when folk, folk Googled them, the Wikidata item would likely make an appearance in the search results. The images the women had created that are in Flickr and had been uploaded into Wiki Commons could possibly be shown on the Google image search results. Our research, tags, blogs, Wikidata items and external identifiers created through um, and as a result of our requests were all coming together to make these women easier to discover. But our work really came to the fore when BHL held their Her Natural History campaign. This was a multi-institutional, multi-platform campaign to raise the awareness and to celebrate the contributions of women to natural history. And this campaign resulted in numerous outcomes, many of which had a direct impact on the richness of metadata available on these women. The BHL cataloging group added more female contributors to the BHL catalog, generating more external identifiers. More artworks by these women were added to the BHL Flickr feed. These were all open access, either in the public domain or freely licensed for reuse, and therefore were able to be uploaded into Wiki Commons. Numerous blog posts were written by the employees of the BHL member institutions, and some of these blogs used research that Michelle and I had undertaken as a starting point, picking it up and running with it. Their research often resulted in the discovery of new sources of information that assisted in ensuring that these women obtained a Wikipedia article. And during that came, campaign, there was also three wiki workshops. These events added significantly to the work that we had undertaken to make these women and their illustrations and the sources describing them more easily findable. And I really believe that this BHL campaign shows how open access to resources can inspire work that in turn generates more knowledge of and about a subject. Open access becomes the leaping off point, enabling research to be collated and linked and sparking further research assisting these overlooked women to get the recognition they so richly deserve for their work. Now, my, finally, my third example. And with this, I'm hoping to show how open access to data and content can help bring attention and professional recognition to specimen collectors, particularly historic women specimen collectors. Currently, natural history collections, their curators and collectors have difficulty in finding ways to illustrate the importance and impact of their work. Unlike scientific publishing, where citation metrics help illustrate and reward expertise, there's few metrics available to show these, the skills needed to collect, 
identify specimens, maintain them, digitize their labels, create and enhance natural history data. But there are websites and tools being developed that use open access data sourced from natural history collections to overcome this issue. And one site that does this is Binomia Tracker. This is a website that's been developed to help provide metrics and visualizations to ensure the numerous people making significant contributions to science through their collecting, their curating, or identifying of species get the same recognition as those scientists who do the writing of the scientific papers describing those species. Binomia Tracker was specifically created as a way to help acknowledge the importance of this type of work. Now, Binomia Tracker uses either the contributor's awkward ID or if their contributor is deceased, their Wikidata item to link the collector to their collection. It uses data that natural history organisations have shared with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF, to help make this connection. Natural history collections add specimen data sets to GBIF. Those data sets list the collectors of the species. Binomia Tracker links the specimens to the collector's ORCID or Wikidata item. GBIF also tracks the scientific papers that reuse and cite those specimen data sets. And Binomia Tracker uses that citation data to link to those papers and those papers to the specimen and in turn to the collector of those specimens. And this linking surfaces the scientific impact of those specimens and help, helps to illustrate how important this collection work is. And in this way, Binomia Tracker gives metrics that show the impact of a person's collecting work. So this is the magnificent Agnes Chase, and you can see in her profile the impact that she's had with her collecting and her, um, uh, her collection. There's 53 uh, scientific papers there, recent scientific papers, that her collections are still um, informing, and she died, I think, in the early 1960s. You can see her work is still being used. Now, when I volunteer for Binomia Tracker, helping make these connections, I tend to concentrate on historic women collectors because there are numerous under-acknowledged women who've contributed to scientific knowledge by collecting those specimens. And these collections continue to be held and studied in museums and herbaria. And as more and more of these collections are digitized and their data sets are published in GBA, more and more historically significant women collectors can be recognized by a binomia tracker. And this information is also a rich vein of data on early women scientists, particularly at a time when they may have been reluctant or more likely unable to obtain academic positions, to publish scientific works, or even to join scientific societies or clubs due to the social norms of the day. But in order to get these women, to link these women to their collecting via Binomia Tracker, the first thing I have to do is get these women into Wikidata. Often, I've only got a name on the specimen label to work from. I undertake research. I attempt to find the woman's birth and married name, their date of birth, their date of death, where they lived, where they collected, where their archives and collections have been donated. I'm also aiming to find a reusable image of them, as well as a sample of their handwriting, because it can be used to assist others to identify specimens they've collected. I want to add all this information to Wikidata, as I have to disambiguate this person I'm researching. I want to make sure that the specimens being attributed are uh, being attributed to the collect correct collector. And much of this research work relies on my ability to have open access to a wide variety of heritage content. Open access to information and documents such as birth, death and marriage certificates, passport applications, genealogy um, websites and databases, town property records, high school and university yearbooks, archive records, field books, I could go on. So I tend to rely heavily not just on open access content sourced from BHL, but other sites such as the Internet Archive that can link to yearbooks or archive records as well as um, genealogy websites that link to open access primary sources such as birth certificates and passport applications. And once I've added all the necessary data and identifiers to the Woman Collective Wikidata item, Binomia Tracker can automatically ingest the information from Wikidata. 
And Binomia Tracker can do this because Wikidata itself is open access, CC0 license. And once the woman, the woman is in Binomia Tracker, volunteers like me can help these women claim their collections, enriching not just the linked um, open data about the specimens themselves, but also ensuring these women get credit for their vital work. And then the binomia tracker identifier can also be added back into Wikidata, making another virtuous cycle of reuse. Now adding these women to Wikidata also has other benefits. Wiki, the Wikidata item can link them to their scientific literature that they may have written, to information held on them by archives, libraries and museums, or to species that have been named after them. And all this information can be queried, leading to new discoveries about these women. But the finding, linking and reusing of this information relies on open access to data about these women. With more and more libraries, archives, museums, genealogy databases, government records and documents becoming open for reuse, the more easier it is for me to find and reuse the information and data on these women. Open access empowers me and others like me to link them to their work and help obtain for them recognition for their valuable contributions. Now I'm hoping by sharing the above three workflows, I've shown you exactly how important it is to take a wide view of what open access means. Open access to published scientific articles is only the tip of the knowledge iceberg. I want you to view open access the way I do, as the ability to reuse knowledge. Without the ability to reuse images, data, citation data, authority control links, and so much more, I and others like me wouldn't be able to do what we do. And finally, I want to challenge you to bring that open access mindset to everything you do. Think about your presentations, your photos, your articles, even your tweets. Open access is my personal default, and I hope you'll consider making it yours too. Thank you. So thank you very much, Siobhan, for that really interesting and wide ranging, I think, um, introduction to really how valuable linked open data can be when you start to be able to combine these seemingly disparate areas into you know into that combined whole um, so obviously everyone is welcome to add questions in the chat and i'll i'll put them to you siobhan but to start off with i wanted to ask um so in your experience which fields of study have done um, have done their licensing the best that you've come across and which ones have been kind of consistently um, consistently poor in terms of the licensing when they apply to their outputs? Um, it seems, I'm, I'm, yeah, that's a hard question because it really does depend on how knowledgeable the person is in a particular institution uh, or how, whether the institution has access to resources or is motivated to access resources on um, things like public domain, knowledge, copyright knowledge, and also open access content, you know, information on open access content. Um, that I find institutions are normally on a journey, so um, an open journey, certainly GLAM institutions, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. So if you find an institution or a even a, a scientific research institute that has a closed licensing for content that I need, I find if I write to them and put my use case, I have about a 50% hit rate for people actually replying and then a significantly less hit rate for someone actually changing it. But I always feel it's worth raising the fact that they're stopping people from reusing their content in a way that's really positive for society. It's worth pointing out that to them and then if I keep nagging them for two or three years, sometimes things change. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up that um, that kind of limitation in your pipeline where you're having to go out and email people and then it's mm. this coin mm. toss as to whether they even reply. I created a project for myself, not on this. I created a separate project basically for a year writing to every single institution that either put a, a roadblock in my way or um, had uh, the wrong licensing on some of the content I wanted to use. Like they may have had Creative Commons licensing on something that was actually in the public domain. I deliberately set off some time in my day 
to be um, proactive and try and sort of convince the whole range of institutions in New Zealand that um, what they were doing was restricting what I was doing. Yeah. So one of the questions as well in the chat window is a, a trivial question. Who's your favourite child scientific illustrator? Oh my goodness. Oh. Oh, I don't have a, oh, there's so many. You don't get it. You don't understand how many there are. I love all of them. <laughs> I, I, oh, no, I can't pick one. I can't. It's not, it's, it's not fair. Um, yeah, if you go look at the, the women's, the VHL flickers, and you look in the women um, illustrators, there's a particular group of albums. And you'll begin to understand what I mean when I say there are so many amazing illus women illustrators, scientific illustrators there. It just blow I couldn't believe it when I first started coming across them and they are just everywhere. So I'd highly recommend having an investigation of the Flickr feed and have a look and choose your own. Brilliant. So if you um, can. A, a, a very, I guess a very future question um, to follow that up. So, I mean, you've described quite a range of projects already done or mm. already in progress well, still in the process of being done <laughs> yeah yeah i guess no end. <laughs> are, are there any projects that you consider completed and finished are there data no. sets that you feel like have no. been fully wrapped up no no there never will be i've mm. had to console myself that there never is going to be because it's a process you can see as soon as you've done some people come along and build on it and then you mm. have to reincorporate it and it just keeps building and building and building. I'm, I'm standing on the, the shoulders of giants when I'm doing this type of work. I'm using, you know, scientific publications that were in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, perhaps about women illustrators and I'm combining that. And then, and then because I can now link it to a whole range of stuff, that it's an increase in, in knowledge about these women, but it's not, um, it's never going to be finished. There's still more you can learn about them because half, I mean, more than half. There's so much that hasn't been digitised or accessible in archives or in field notebooks, let alone anything else. Yeah, it's never going to be finished. Um, and actually, there's a, a, a comment in the chat window, uh, you know, completely agreeing with you that institutions are on a journey. Um, mm. And the question linked to that is, what's the biggest blocker, do you think, in helping them move along that line? Um, they're risk averse. They're risk averse. Uh, they're scared. They are scared. They're, they're worried that someone's going to come along and do bad things with their content. And the only way to try and um, reassure them and to uh, make, to persuade them that that's not really such a major issue is to get them to be prepared to take that risk. And the only way you get them to be prepared to take that risk is give them a use case to say, look, this is the use I want to do with it. I think it's going to contribute not just to um, the good of everyone, but actually really to the good of your institution. Your institution is going to get more exposure for your content on the internet as a result of the work I'm doing. Um, I think you can trust what I'm doing. If it's on the internet already, the bad actors are there already. Um, so take a risk, open it up, and let me do my good work. You know, that's, that's what I try, how I try and frame it. Yeah, that's a good point because because I guess by by being over restrictive and either not applying a license or applying really restrictive versions of the Creative Commons mm. license, mm. really what they're doing is they're punishing the good actors because the bad actors have already ignored it. Well, also the other thing is I tend to work in in the area where it's historic. So if they shove a Creative Commons license on something that's in the public domain, I'm completely entitled mm. to ignore it. It just it doesn't make any legal sense. So, and I'll point, I, you know, if I'm really feeling good and generous and, and want to sacrifice my time, I'll write in and tell them that. But a lot of the time I think, nah, back of them. They've put the wrong um, license on something. They don't know what they're talking about. It's public domain. It's hmm. well out of copyright, well out. So I'm going to use it. And then the problem is, is that sometimes I get very bolshy and I must admit sometimes terms of use on their website doesn't get read. I don't click mm -hmm. on that link. So I don't know whether I've been bad. So actually, talk, talking of these these kind of conversations that you end up having with you know with the the hosters of content or the producers of content, mm. uh, one mm. of the um, one of the comments in the chat is um, uh, that they reckon it would be good if you were to put up somewhere appropriate a pro forma letter that you use oh. under you know under some sort of Creative Commons license. It, Do you have it, anything? It, it, I I it it 
my problem is is that when I come across it, it's, it always seems to be individual. There's so many permutations of how mm. institutions put roadblocks in front of what I do that a pro forma letter won't work. It's also, you get, you know, when you read a letter and you get a feel, whether someone's, you know, like generating them out, I, I find that I suspect, I haven't tried it, but I suspect that that approach may not be as effective as if you specifically write with um, a, an actual passion and real voice to say, look, this is what I'm doing. This is the particular roadblock that you're putting in my way. It's not normally, you know, blanket CC by um, NC, non-commercial use um, creative commons licenses that's in my way. It tends to be a whole range of things. And I like prying them open for the public domain stuff first and say, look, it's public domain. Did you realize you stuck a Creative Commons license on something that is in the public domain and I'm going to reuse whether you like it or not? Um, but I just wanted to let you know you've made this error. I don't normally go with that aggressive. And I'm very touchy-feely and lovely when I write letters <laughs> or emails. Um, and just try and convince them. And then once you've got them starting along the, the road of open, you can gradually convince them to be more and more open so long as you can reassure them that what's happening is both good for everybody and very good for them. I mean, you've mm -hmm. got to realise everyone's um, got a, a self-motivation to, to do this as well. They, they've got to be motivated for themselves as well as for the good of everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, having having heard what you've said about, you know, these these interactions have to be personalized and they have to be specific to the exact use case. Um, mm. I do have to reflect what's gone on in the, in the comments, which is people are still really keen for at least an example one to get them <laughs> over there, just to get them I'll over what, their, I'll, I'll, um, I will, yeah, their okay, confidence I'll hurdle. Do, I can, oh, I don't, um, I can see if I can pull up. I don't want to sort of dob in particular institutions. So I'll have a look on my uh, my letter file that I've kept and see if I've got some, some things that I can sort of make anonymous. A redacted and, example. Yes, yeah, something like that. And I'll put it in my, my Twitter feed as well so, so that people have got an idea. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and so there's a, an additional question here that I want to get to, which is, um, what should institutions do to engage beyond just openly sharing and licensing their content? Because many assume that once it's open, their work, you know, no. they've openly licensed it, their work is done. Um, so what, what more should institutions be if, doing after that they, point? Yeah, if they want to engage with people, they've got to go to the places where people might be interested in their content. So if they've got genealogy content, go to your local genealogy society or at least write an article or propose to write an article in their blog or their newsletter to point people. You've got to do your, think of yourself as your own um, institution's press officer. You've got to go on outreach and then say, look, we've got these resources, come and use them. I mean, my automatic default, because I'm a Wikipedian, is to say, reach out to your local Wikipedia group. Because if you've got content that can be reused in Wiki Commons or um, maybe you know any of the other Wiki projects, I'm sure there's people out there who would be keen to engage with your content. But you've got to let them know it's there. You, people aren't necessarily going to stumble over it on the internet. There's so much on the internet that's quite difficult to do yeah. that. And, and actually, so that's a that's a call to action for the um, for also the media officers at any institutions mm. listening, or yeah. or the research yeah. officers as well, because we're yeah. within institutions like uh, universities and and libraries, we're we're often really keen on this idea of you know reach leads to engagement, leads to impact, but mm. making sure that you're really doing everything that you can to ensure that that pipeline actually occurs for, for well, the outputs that we're putting out. I agree. I agree. It can be something as, as simple as a tweet. I've gone in um, some, some of the uh, contributors to the BHL, I follow their Twitter stream, and they may tweet about a particular collector or a particular illustrator or a particular person who's written a scientific article. Now, obviously, I'm more interested in historic because it's easier, but there's no reason why it can't be anyone of any time. And I will have a, I'll look at that. And because I, my brain's like that now, it didn't used to be, but now it is like that where I see something like that. Oh, that's interesting. And I don't just go and read the blog. I go and read the blog and then use it 
in the data and Wikidata. And if it's appropriate, I might put it as some external link or perhaps the citation, depending on the how well the blog's been written and cited and all the rest of it, there's, there's limits with Wikipedia. But I may use it as a, a reference for that, or I may just use it as a jumping off point to start my own research uh, into that particular person. So something as um, social media shouldn't be underestimated, because but mm -hmm. outreach to groups that are actually interested in your content and may use it in ways that you don't necessarily anticipate is also a really good feather to think, you know, feather in there. Quiver, yeah, actually, that that the fact that um, the people producing data and information and knowledge might not be able to anticipate what possible uses there no. could be for it is a really good a really good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one other thing that I wanted to pull out um, from um, from this for people whose focus uh, who may have heard of concepts like fair data principles, the findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, is again to you know think about those principles back in this context again from what Siobhan's been talking about mm. because I mm. think one of the one of the trip ups in that acronym that people often have is the interoperable and what does it really mean to be interoperable um, and obviously there's a lot of facets to that but this is a really good example of where by making the data interoperable different disparate parts of that data set can talk to each other and be yes. combined mm, yes very much so and it's always going to be people are very um siloed people don't I mean, I know I am because I tend to do biodiversity. I've got to restrict myself somehow, otherwise I'll never get anything done. But other, when it comes to academics, they are quite narrow focused because they're researchers and they're specialising. But they don't necessarily understand how much can be done with their content in other contexts. And so to, to make it um, fair makes it much easier to be able to expand the reach of what they've done. Yeah, I agree. Well, I think that that's a fantastic message to end this session on in that case. Um, so I've put in the chat window the link where you'll be able to find a recording for this session um, once it is up and the recording will probably go up tomorrow. Um, and addition, uh, in addition, there's five minutes left if you've been inspired to learn a little bit of Wikidata to sign up for the follow-up workshop that will be starting in five minutes uh, on um, a how-to for linking up open data using Wikidata. So thank you again, Siobhan. Excellent discussion, excellent talk as always. Thank you. Um, and for anyone who wants to continue this discussion uh, after the end, you can find Siobhan on Twitter. Great. Thank you very much.